Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the webinar organized by the European Reference Kidney Network, coordinated by Professor Franz Schaefer from Heidelberg. Uh, the topic of today is the management of X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets in children and adults. Uh, and it will be presented by Professor Dieter Hafner from Hanover, Germany. My name is Elena Levchenko. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from Belgium, and I will moderate this webinar out of my office in Leuven. During the webinar, the slides will be projected on your screen, and you will be able to send us your question using the special tab on your attendees panel. You can send your questions anytime during the presentation, and uh, uh, Professor Hafner will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and the slides will be published on the website of ERCnet. Let me now introduce in more detail the speaker of today, Dieter Hafner. He's a professor of pediatrics and head of the Department of Pediatric, Kidney, Liver and Metabolic Diseases at Hanover Medical School. His main interests are the genetic and uh, mechanistic exploration of rare kidney diseases, such as hereditary cystic kidney disease, X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, and mineral and bone disorders in children with chronic kidney disease, CKD and BD. He is coordinating the ESPN working group on CKD and BD, their International Pediatric Nephrology Association, Best Practices and Standards Committee, and the Guidelines and Pathways Task Force of the European Reference Kidney Network for Rare Kidney Diseases. He has led or been heavily involved in several randomized control clinical trials, patient registries, and clinical practice recommendations. He has also published over 180 original scientific articles, reviews, editorials, and book chapters, including those about X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. So this is really a topic of his expertise. And now um, I would like to ask uh, Professor Hafner uh, to present his talk and please be active and not shy and ask questions because you really have an expert to answer. Thank you very much, Dieter. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Can you hear me? Is the voice is okay? Yeah, Elena? Okay, so I think uh, I'm on, on uh, on the screen now, and uh, I would like to thank first Elena for this nice introduction and for Erkner to giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. So it's entitled On the Management of X-Linked Hyperphosphatemic Rickets in Children and Adults. Uh, first, my disclosures. You may notice that there's also a company, Kiva Kirin, there which makes all the nice products for the disease. I just want to mention this. And then coming to the introduction of the disease. So there are many synonyms for the disease. It's X-linked, that is why it's called X-linked hypophosphatemia. And it's other uh, um, synonyms like vitamin D resistant rickets because it was first described in children with rickets not responding to vitamin D. And then another synonym, which is also um, um, emphasizing that about 50% of cases are familial. So it's also called familial hyperphosphatemic rickets. It's the most frequent inherited phosphate wasting disorder. It accounts for about 80% of cases of um, um, hyperphosphatemic rickets. Its incidence is about 1 to 20,000 uh, individuals. So in Germany, we have about 120 children with XLH currently uh, under treatment or observation. It was first described by Albright very long ago in 1937 and just described as rickets um, occurring in children or already in infancy, resistance even to high doses of vitamin D. So the people at this time realized that it was not just a vitamin D defi deficient rickets, it must be something different. And then 20 years later, it was realized that it follows an X-linked dominant inheritance. Uh, that means that um, if the father has the disease and he has a, a, a daughter, then the daughters get not affected, but he uh, 
uh, gets um, affected to 50 percent it's all affected sorry but if uh, if he has a son then the son always are uh, healthy because then he just gives the y chromosome okay so and then in the 70s there uh, was some evidence that there's a humoral basis uh, first described in 74 uh, but the notice that if a patient with excellent hypophosphatemic rickets requires renal transplantation, then the disease, the disease recurs. That means that the healthy kidney is again affected, indicating that there was something in the blood. And the same was proven in animals. If you do kidney cross transplantation, for example, from a healthy wild type mice into hip mice, then the, um, uh, the, the animal is still phosphaturic. And on the other hand, if you put a, a kidney from a hip mice into a healthy wild type mice, then the mice, the mouse doesn't develop hypophosphatemia. Uh, in 1995, uh, it was proven that it is, uh, disease is caused by uh, mutations in the PEX gene. And in 2003, the humoral factor uh, was, um, was um, noticed and it's the fibroblast growth factor 23. And these levels are usually elevated or sometimes markedly elevated in patients with X-linked hypophosphatemia. So the puzzle was more or less solved after 70 years of research. So having said this, um, I have to confess that even nowadays we don't know how mutations in the PEX gene, gene in the end uh, relate to elevated FGF23 levels. We know that the ostocytes in uh, patients um, affected by hyperphosphatemia uh, produce a large amount of FGF23, but why they do this, we don't know. And there are of course other, um, other um, causes of the disease, that means that F elevated FGF23 is not explaining the whole disease, but it's uh, it's the major factor triggering the symptoms of the patients. So by the mutations, they, we have an elevated secretion of FGF23 in the bone, and uh, and the main um, organ which is affected by elevated FGF23 are is the kidney. In the kidney, in the proximal tubule, usually phosphate gets reabsorbed by approximately 80% by the NAP2A and 2C recept, uh, transporters, and their expression gets downregulated by FGF23. And in the end, phosphate reabsorption gets decreased, and the patient has a phosphate leakage. That means they have low levels of phosphate, but despite that, they have still phosphaturia going on. For example, if a human being doesn't eat phosphate in the end, we will, we will not find any phosphate in urine. In these patients, they have low phosphate in serum, but also still phosphaturia. And the second, second thing is that FG23 interferes with the uh, synthesis and the degradation of active vitamin D. You may remember that in the kidney, there's the one alpha hydroxylase, which uh, converts 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 vitamin D, that's in the end the active vitamin D. And this synthesis, uh, synthase gets, um, um, uh, it gets decreased. And on the other hand, the degradation of active vitamin D, which is done by 24 hydroxylase, is increased. So overall, increased degradation and decreased synthesis which leads in the end to low or sometimes normal vitamin D levels, but the, these must be um, 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 uh, weighed as decreased, since in patients with low phosphate, you would expect that 125 gets upregulated. So in the end, uh, you have phosphaturia, low 125 levels, and 125 is uh, important for phosphate reabsorption in the gut. So this also um, supports the low phosphate levels in serum. And by this, vitamin D deficiency and low phosphate levels, the bone 
which heavily needs phosphate and calcium to um, perform the um, mineralization of cartilage and uh, a bone gets a mineralization defect and this is called rickets in children because they have open growth plates and in adults it's called osteomalacia which can cause um, leg bowing or fractures in the adults or bone bone pain so the children are usually doing fine and the problem starts if they start to uh, walk because then the weight bearing extremities uh, get some pressure and the patients develop the leg bowing and the patients have uh, um, 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 swelling of, of the wrist in the in the blood we see a combination of elevated alkaline phosphatase which indicates a high bone turnover we have uh, and decrease uh, and diminished reabsorption from phosphate which can be calculated as the tmp over gfr that's the uh, phosphate reabsorption by the kidney uh, normalized to glomerular filtration rate we can do this by the nomogram of bov or we can do this by the for Bodeo formula and they can nicely demonstrate that with respect to the given serum phosphate level, patients have still phosphate leakage. And then the patients with extinct hypophosphatemic rickets, usually they have normal vitamin D levels or slightly um, low vitamin D levels, but the slightly low vitamin D levels are just present as in any other healthy ch uh, children um, when you look around and you take blood samples uh, outside in healthy children then about 50 percent of patients have a positive family history and then it's quite clear that it's excel age and it's recommended oops recommended to perform a genetic analysis um, for the pix pex gene so you underline the diagnosis um, we don't need a bone biopsy uh, to um, diagnose hypophosphatemic rickets. And I just want to show you this slide to illustrate what's going on in the bone. And you just have to focus on the slide in the middle. You see here the trabecular, and here the orange um, staining, it's staining for osteoid. Osteoid is just unmineralized bone matrix. Usually, if you uh, do a bone biopsy in a child, you see that there's almost no orange here, and you see a lot of trabecular. That means the uh, osteoid gets nicely uh, mineralized, and you get bone. In children with external age, they have a diminished mineralization, and this is uh, so the bone, everything is in orange. If you look radiologically, um, uh, I just demonstrate a little bit. And the, if the children starting to walk, they get bowing of the lower extremities. They can have uh, geno uh, vara like here, or they could uh, geno valga like here. And if you look at the X-ray, you see the bowing of the legs. And if you just focus on the um, on the growth plate here, you see the widening of the growth plane. You see the distance here is elevated, and you see the fraying of the growth plate and this is typical typical feature of the disease and if the children start to walk they have usually a wetland gait or white based gait um, the children have a normal height and weight at birth and usually during the end of the first at the second uh, year of life they have a diminished growth rate resulting in a short stature. And these are data from, um, I think it was 70 children uh, followed up in the center in Paris by Agnès Lignard. And uh, about 40% of those patients all been on conventional treatment, started usually at the age of 0.5, up to four year had diminished uh, height. And you can see we can be happy under conventional treatment if the height just follows below the third centiles or below two uh, standard deviations. And the mean final height in the, in the uh, French population 
uh, in male was 160 centimeter, that's about five centimeter below the third centile, and 153 centimeter for female. In Germany, we made uh, an analysis by a detailed anthropometric assessment by an anthropometrist by Miroslav Sivicinyak. And uh, you can see the linear body dimensions. I just explain a little bit that stature, the mean stature of these 89 patients, all on conventional treatment, was about um, minus 2.2 standard deviations. But as you can see here, the sitting height that resembles in the end of the trunk was more or less only slightly decreased by only one standard deviation. And you look closer, the arms were also more, more, uh, more um, affected than the shrunk. And the most affected um, was the uh, leg length with minus 2.7 standard deviations. And you can nicely see this here. This is a healthy sibling, and this is the, the girl affected by axle age. And you see this discrepancy between the legs and the trunk. And we can, of course, calculate this by calculating uh, the sitting height index as a marker of or measure of body proportion. Sitting height index is the ratio between trunk length and total body height. And then you can, of course, calculate standard deviation scores, and you can see that children already at low age, at the age of two or three years, have a markedly elevated sitting height index uh, indicating body disproportion. And despite conventional treatment, the sitting height index ever increases until adult height. And at this time, it's about three standard deviations. And I would like again to point out that all patients were treated on conventional treatment and uh, uh, they had received high doses of active vitamin D and phosphate. So um, coming from to also Malaysia, as you can see here, it's characterized by defective mineralization. These are all x-rays from adult patients and usually in children you don't see those things, but the what the uh, parents or the children uh, report, they report on bone pain. And adult patients can have a um, pseudofracture, like this patient here, and pseudofractures are, uh, uh, are characterized that the cortical layer is still intact. Uh, other features uh, are the, the degenerative osteoarthropathy. It's again more common uh, in adults, about uh, two thirds of adults have some kind of osteoarthropathy, and you can only uh, appreciate this if you make a thorough clinical evaluation or performing x rays. And the question is, why does it happen? And we get some hint from animal studies. Um, when you look at the hip, hip mice, hip mice are the other largest uh, animal models of axle age. And here, the thickness of the uh, um, articular cartilage is giving for control animals and um, hip mice. And you can see the thickness of the cartilage is less than 50% than in healthy mice. That indicates that the cartilage is not well done in those animals and this will probably be the same in patients resulting in osteoarthropathy. And tesiopathy, it's a horrible, horrible word. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's characterized by calcification of tendons and ligaments, like you can see here. That's all calcification, or you can see here at the knee. And this occurs in about 70% or between 40 and 70% of adults. And unfortunately, this does not respond to conventional treatment. So conventional treatment, um, heals or improve rickets, but it doesn't help with endotesopathy. Uh, and this is a major burden in the adult patient, patients with axle age. And some of them can't even go to work because then at some stage they have to walk. Another uh, problem 
uh, getting more important in adolescents or in adults are uh, tooth abscesses, like seen here. And uh, it's due to a hypermineralization of the dentin. So the PEX gene is not only expressed in bone cells, but it's also in, uh, expressed in the teeth. So in the end, the patients have micro defects. The micro defects um, are very well appreciated by bacteria. And this results into a bacterial uh, population and in the end in tooth abscess. Um, the good thing is that conventional treatment markedly uh, improves the tooth status in uh, patients with excellent age. So it's highly recommended that patients with tooth problem, especially also in adult patients with excellent age, that they continue with uh, conventional treatment also in adults. And then there are other rather rare complications like chondrocinostosis, like you can see here on this child, the secretal suture is usually affected. It's not quite clear why it happens, but one explanation is that there are FGF2 and FGF3 receptor also in the bone, and FGF23 triggers uh, this, um, the, um, uh, the chondrocinostosis. And there are other um, rare complications like Chiari malformation, which can result in increased intracranial pressure. The same is also true for cranial synostosis. Patient can have uh, seringomyelia, and uh, rarely in adolescents, but more often in adults, hearing loss, tinnitus vertigo. And you may appreciate if you have a severe problem with your legs and walking, then you rather gain weight. And uh, we are afraid that also the cardiovascular burden in adult patients may be increased in XLA patients, but this must be shown in further studies. So the treatment starts usually in infancy. If you have a positive uh, family history, usually you can do the PEX gene ana analysis directly after birth or you can check the uh, biochemical features of the disease. It's uh, usually um, um, uh, informative at the age of three up to six months, and you can clearly diagnose it. And then uh, patients need treatment from infancy until adulthood. Uh, it's not usually done by a pediatric endocrinologist or nephrologist like I am. You need a whole team, you need a dentistry colleague, you need uh, orthopedic uh, support, you may need some ear, nose, uh, uh, throat doctors, uh, and you need physiotherapist. So symptomatic treatment uh, consists of oral phosphorus in combination of active vitamin D. It's always the combination because you need active vitamin D uh, since patients are deficient in active vitamin D. The second thing is you give phosphate uh, uh, only, then secondary hypothyroidism occurs. And the third reason is that active vitamin D increases phosphate reabsorption from the gut. By this, it's expected that the, uh, we have a clear improvement or healing of rickets, which is indicating by straightening of the legs, by normalization or let's say only slightly elevated alkaline phosphatase uh, blood levels, growth within the lower normal range if you are lucky, and pain control. Um, the conventional treatment is associated usually with mild side effects, but they can happen. In about 30 up to 70 percent of patients, nephrocarcinosis is described, as you can see here in this patient with some nephrocarcinosis. The good answer will, to the nephrocarcinosis is that the kidney function usually stays normal, and you try to avoid this by regular checking ultrasound, uh, the calcification of the kidney, and checking the calcium creatinine ratio. And hyperthyroidism can occur if patients ex um, receive very large doses of phosphate and maybe not enough active vitamin D and then rarely 
tertiary hypothyroidism like in this patient can occur and sometimes they need a pyothyroidectomy which is quite rare but this could happen if there's no adequate treatment overall like in many other chronic diseases early treatment is associated with better outcome so if you have a positive family history it's recommended to start treatment very early usually most centers start at the age of six months uh, very important to note is that if you give phosphate, we don't give phosphate to normalize the phosphate levels. As you can see here, in this nice study, this is the normal range of phosphate in the gray bars. And you can see that the phosphate levels are still low, even if you give high doses of phosphorus. So the tailoring of the treatment with respect to phosphate is not done by phosphate serum levels or TNP over GFR. It's rather done by the clinical aspects I just explained to you. Okay, there's some limitation. Uh, we have an improvement of symptoms, but it does not cure the disease. It's a genetic disease. We can't do this just by medical treatment. We must face that it's a very response among patients and there's a risk of side effects and uh, conventional treatment somehow also triggers or promotes a, a vicious circle since both phosphate and active vitamin D stimulate FG23 levels. This is very important uh, also if you get the patient sent to your office, uh, to your uh, um, outpatient clinic, and someone says, is it really XLH? Can you confirm this? And if you check for FG23 levels in the patient already on active vitamin D and phosphate, there's no mean, uh, meaning, meaningful um, results because in every patient, even if it doesn't have XLH, FJ23 levels will be uh, raised. So the bones are very tricky in the management. Here you see some example of patients follow up in, in Paris and they made a nice analysis. Um, they had data on about 40%, uh, 41 patients attaining near adult height and at stitched since the age almost 32 percent of the patients required um, corrective leg surgery which can be done by conventional um, osteotomy or also by um, eight plates uh, uh, insertion which is also very good in especially in patients with a rather mild bowing anyway why does it cause occur we can speculate maybe we need higher doses of vitamin d or phosphorus of course we can blame the patient the poor patient is not compliant but that's not true there are many patients even in one family getting the medication very regularly and some of them have very severe disease some of them don't so it's also possible that there are maybe some modifier genes or some pec, muta pec mutation which result in a more severe disease. Coming to the adult treatment, I apologize for this uh, very comprehensive slide, but I will follow uh, you through the slide. So if the patients uh, are um, pediatric, we treat them with active vitamin D and uh, phosphate until uh, bone growth is complete. And if they are young adults, we usually check, check them uh, clinically biochemically and uh, if there are any problems also with x-rays. If they are symptomatic with respect to enthesopathy and osteoarthritis, there's no reason to um, commence them with um, conventional treatment. The patient will just get pharmacological treatment of the analgetics and uh, physiotherapy. But if they have skeletal pain, osteomalacia or pseudo fractures, they deserve to get treated with phosphate and active vitamin D, but the dosages are usually lower in those patients. If they are asymptomatic, we don't give them conventional treatment. If we have a planned uh, surgical intervention of the bones, or if females get pr pregnant or um, give lactation to their ba uh, baby or have menopause, uh, most of the physicians recommend some mild dosage of active vitamin D and phosphate. And the monitoring is, of course, more or less the same as in children. We check 
calcium phosphate, alkaline phosphatase in blood, PTH, creatinine, and urinary calcium creatinine ratio. So there's a new uh, treatment now uh, getting available and proven in, in trials, which is Bursamab. Um, I already explained you the pathway that we have elevated FGF23 levels and Bursamab is a human antibody against FGF23. It binds FGF23 in the circulation and thereby FGF23 still circulates and gets degraded, but it doesn't um, um, can't do the deleterious effects on the kidney with respect to the inhibition of vitamin D synthesis and inhibition of fluid reabsorption. So having said this, uh, there's a nice trial just uh, published in the New England Journal in May last year by the group from Tom Carpenter. Uh, they treated 52 children aged 5 to 12 years with severe XLH despite conventional treatment. Almost all of them were on conventional treatment over a mean period of seven years. And important to note, conventional treatment was stopped two weeks before start of Burusumab to prove that phosphate levels are really decreased before you uh, start with this drug. It was a randomized trial without control, but there are two arms. They had one arm where Burosumab was given every two weeks in blue, and then also every four weeks. And the results shown are the results after 64 weeks. And first, I would like to highlight the effects on, on um, TMP over GFR. So TMP over GFR, the no lower normal range would be about 3.2 milligram per deciliter. That's about one point one millimole per liter, and as you can see in the blue line, T over P of over GFR gets quickly normalized. If you um, uh, give Borosum up every four weeks, then you see an up and down, so that's not as effective. And the same is true for phosphate levels. Normal range is here giving in gray, and you can see that uh, the blue, if you give uh, Borosum up every two weeks and you increase the dosage, from 0.4 milligram per kilogram every two weeks uh, up to two milligram per kilogram um, every two weeks, depending if you achieve the target of a normal phosphate levels. You can see that in all patients, in the end, you achieve a serum phosphate level in the lower normal range. This was the goal of the study. Active vitamin D levels, they increase a little bit, but we are very happy that it was not elevated, so it's not in side effects that's wanted, that 125 levels gets normalized. Then you get some healing of rickets. You can see the elevated alkaline phosphate levels, which uh, 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 get reduced, and the same is true for the hard endpoint of the rickets severity score. It's in score, uh, originally developed for uh, vitamin D deficient rickets. It ranged between 0 and 10. And in XLH patients, you have usually a, rick a score between 0 and uh, 0 and 5. So they had moderate um, um, rickets score bef before treatment, although they were on conventional treatment. And you can see that the rickets score nicely diminished, was reduced by more than 50%. Uh, if you give it every two weeks, it was more effective than giving every four weeks. And here's an example for the physical, uh, um, physical functional. It's a walking, uh, walking test. And I just start the video. Above, you see two uh, patients before uh, starting Borosumab and then after 64 weeks. And you can see, although the above patients was started earlier, the, they will be, um, uh, in the end, uh, coming later to the end point. You can see that they are already back after 64 weeks. So they are uh, much better in the walking ability. And this can be also nicely demonstrated when you calculate uh, the percentage of predicted. That means 100% would be normal, that normal children of this age. And you can see both the treatment modalities, the walking ability, 
gets uh, improved. So now it's uh, approved, uh, uh, Bozamba is approved in Europe by the EMA. Uh, this was done in spring last year. So it's approved for the treatment in children, not in adults, but in children aged above one year and in adolescents with growing skeletal skeletons, that means they must have open um, growth plates and uh, but they need to have an evidence of radiography evidence of the word bone disease. So I would like to conclude XLH is a severe disease for significant morbidity. It requires lifelong multidisciplinary management. Uh, the symptomatic treatment is quite good, but it does not cure the disease and has some limitation in side effects. There are major challenges, challenges first growth deficiency, bone deformities, recurrent dental infections and adherence, especially in adolescent patients. And Bursumab is a promising treatment for XLH and it's of course important to collect the national history of the disease in prospective registry on treated patients because now we only have some reports of 80 person or 80 patients or 40 patients and we don't need we don't know the whole picture and to this aim for example in germany we started a prospective observational study where we all look at all these endpoints i just mentioned to you growth t status uh, cardiovascular status quality of life to get more information and this is also done in many other countries and uh, last year uh, uh, one and a half year ago a guideline project was started initiated by the european society of pedonephrology and i was had the opportunity to chair this project from 20 uh, physicians from europe um, including pediatric nephrologists pediatric endocrinologists, adult endocrinologists, orthopedic physicians, dentistry, neurosurgical um, physicians, and patient representatives. And it will hopefully come out in a few uh, couple of weeks in Nature Refuse, and I would be happy to make the next webinar on this topic on these guidelines. And finally, I would like to let you know that there's a very important next webinar on the February 26th, it's done by Marina Vivarelli, and the title is NDCD 20th Treatment in Children with Different Forms of Nephrotic Syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dieter, for a very comprehensive okay. presentation. Now there is time uh, for uh, the Hello. questions to the audience, so please prepare um, the poll questions. Uh, So, Dieter, maybe you can read the questions and, uh, and then give the audience a chance to vote. Okay, uh, excellent. So, uh, my, my uh, loudspeaker was down, so I didn't hear anything. Okay, so uh, the first question, I think it's four question, is um, hyperphosphatemic rickets, rickets is most commonly, option one, an acquired disorder, inherited as an autosomal dominant disorder, inherited as an X-linked dominant disorder or inherited as an autosomal recessive disorder. So please vote. Yeah, that sounds good. Excellent. Here we go to the next question. Pex mutations lead to decreased levels of circulating FG23, decreased expression of 1 alpha hydroxylase, decreased expression of 24 hydroxylase, and the th fourth is all of above. Please vote. Okay, excellent, that's very good. 
So the right answer is a decreased expression of one alpha hydroxylase. And please remember, it's elevated levels of FJ23. Uh, and of course, it's not decreased expression of 24 hydroxylase, it's elevated expression of hydroxylase. Sorry for asking you this question. <laughs> so let's move to the next. Um, now we're coming to the bone. Disordered mineralization of growth plate, rickets, and bone tissue called osteomalacia in XLH is characterized by a shortened mineralization lag time, a lack of alkaline phosphatase, accumulation of osteoid, accumulation of osteoblasts. It's a little bit tricky, but I think you will make it. Please vote. Okay, so it's accumulation of osteoid. Remember the orange, and it's not a shortened, but it's a, a it's an elevated lag time because mineralization lag time means that that that's the time which is need to mineralize. So it's uh, it's uh, an increased uh, lag time. Okay, is there a, a question left? Yes, we have one left. Okay, the conventional treatment of hyperphosphatemic rickets includes all phosphate supplementation, low phosphate diet, high doses of 24, 25 dehydroxy vitamin D, and all low calcium diet. Please vote. Excellent, excellent. So I see that the vast majority answered all questions absolutely correct. I'm very happy. Okay, so that was um, the last four questions and now we are going to the questions from the audience. Um, so the first question was from uh, Jalili Michele from Belgium and the question is whether you would recommend to use uh, Brosimab um, until the age of 12 years, uh, such as what was published in New England Journal paper, or until the patients are completely grown up or until 18? What, what would be your recommendation? So um, the, the medication is licensed for children aged above one year until um, physical closure. So if a patient has... Um, significant burden with uh, bone disease. That means they have elevated alkaline phosphatase, they may have some bone pain, they may have, uh, they have retroelectrical sign of ongoing rickets on x-ray, then even if they get adequate treatment with uh, conventional treatment of active vitamin D and phosphate, and if you are happy that uh, you have this drug available, then uh, I think it's okay to start those patients on this new treatment. Okay, thank you very much. There is another question. Thank you for the conference. It was excellent. My question is, uh, what about um, treatment? Uh, should we treat uh, all patients, all pediatric patients with XLH uh, with uh, Dorosimab? Uh, that's a little bit uh, the similar yeah. question uh, similar. like before. And uh, it's very interesting if you look at the license process in, um, in North America, the FDA approved uh, Burzimab for all patients with XLH and they didn't uh, require uh, an overt bone disease. This is different in Europe where the uh, EMA required that there's retrological evidence of bone disease in those patients. And uh, in our uh, uh, gui uh, guidelines from the European uh, working group, including the ESPN, we agreed that uh, patients need the correct diagnosis of actual age. And if they're aged above one year, and they are, if they are still growing, and if they have uh, retrological evidence of overt bone disease, then 
we feel that it's uh, that people should consider a treatment with brosimab in those patients if uh, conventional treatment doesn't work. Okay, uh, so there are quite some questions on uh, brosimab. So there are some questions which are uh, a little bit similar. But another question about this topic is. Uh, what do you think about using Verosimab in patients with hyperparathyroidism? In XLH patients? Yeah, in XLH. Yeah. That's, that's not the indication. Uh, it's not, uh, there's no, uh, no studies um, investigating the effect of Verosimab in patients with severe secondary hyperthyroidism because those patients were not included in the trials and there's no evidence at all to recommend this or to say it's not working because we don't know. Okay. Um, there is another question. Uh, I'm sorry for those whose name I'm not uh, uh, pronouncing because I cannot now see all the names who are asking questions on my display. Sorry for that. So another question is about um, how it comes that sometimes a patient uh, develop knocked knee instead of bowed legs. So have an I, idea why sometimes <laughs> it falls from, from both. <laughs> I, I don't know, and but maybe the chair knows it. Elena, do you know it? I don't know it. Well, I, I don't know, know but it's, it's, sometimes it's true. Maybe it has somehow to, 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 to do with growth pattern of the legs. I, I don't know, but sometimes you do see it, but I have no idea why it happens. Maybe it's how they walk, how they, uh, how they walk. So it's maybe, I don't, I don't know. And even within one family, it's uh, the picture is so difficult, uh, different. Some, if you have siblings, one sibling has an uh, Genoa Vara, the other has Genoa Valga. So I don't know. No, me neither. I, um, I have actually another question um, uh, which you might uh, uh, would like to comment on. Um, what about the use of uh, recombinant growth hormone in these kids? Uh, uh, you have shown that the growth is severely retarded despite of uh, conventional treatment. So uh, what do you recommend and what are you doing in your own patients? Are you using growth hormone? So uh, first I have to admit that growth hormone is not licensed for this indication. So it's off-label use. And if you use it, uh, you have, must be careful because uh, the insurance company may want that you have to pay for it by yourself. <laughs> And um, it's uh, patients with XLH, they have no uh, growth hormone deficiency. But we know that growth hormone uh, increases uh, bone formation rates and increases uh, proliferation of growth plate cartilage. And we know that it also uh, increases the renal phosphorus threshold concentration. So this was the reason why we and other people performed several studies and we performed a randomized clinical trial in sh very short children with axle age and the primary endpoint was um, standardized height change after three years and after three years there was a significant um, better um, growth outcome in the patients on growth hormone but uh, I have to admit that the final height data were not better in the growth hormone group compared to the control group this was at least partly due to the fact that we have uh, many patients were lost or follow up. So in the end, we only have five patients in each group. So we, the study was probably also underpowered. And in my clinical practice, we treat some patients uh, with uh, growth hormone if they have very severe growth failure. And but before that, we have to negotiate this with the uh, insurance company if they pay for this. So this is uh, in our recommendation uh, as far as i remember we say that we don't recommend this for routine treatment but it's fair to consider it in patients with, which have very very severe growth failure okay thank you very much we have um, a few more questions about the resume. i think they will be two last questions uh, because of the time frame so the first question is uh, uh, well, what is the route of administration of berosimab? And the second question is whether you should continue oral phosphate and vitamin D during berosimab treatment. I think 
think this will be two last questions. And for those uh, who so have the, other questions, maybe um, we can answer them later on because uh, Dieter kindly offered already to give another seminar on, on the topic, uh, highlighting the new yeah. guidelines. So the root of administration and phosphate and vitamin D during the resumap treatment. Please. So uh, the root of administration is subcutaneously every two weeks, starting dose 0.4 milligram per kilogram. And um, conventional treatment, active vitamin D and uh, phosphorus so phosphate salts are contraindicating. So you must not give uh, burosumab together with conventional treatment because there may be some risk of calcification and it's a contraindication. This is a no-go. Okay, thank you very much. I think we had an excellent uh, seminar and uh, a very active audience. I would like to thank uh, Dieter for the beautiful lecture and the audience for being here today with us and for being so active and asking questions. Thank you very much. The webinar is closed. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.